Hello, dear students. Uh, so this is the seventh lecture on Macbeth, which I'll be delivering. And uh, in this lecture, I'll be starting from Act One, Scene Six of William Shakespeare's Macbeth. So up till now, we have studied till Act One, Scene Five, which was where we got to get a glimpse of Lady Macbeth. Now we shall go into Act 1, Scene 6, where we shall find that she plays the role of the hostess. Now, Granville Berger has suggested that this scene is like an idyll. That is, it is uh, an idyll interposed between two very stormy scenes, and it and it uh, functions as a prelude to the upcoming tragedy because it shows the holiness of the Macbeths in their ambition and the purity of their perversion. Now, Act 1, Scene 6 takes place before the castle in Verness, where everybody has arrived, hobos, uh, torches, Enter Duncan, Malcolm, Donald Bane, Banco, Lennox, Macduff, Ross, Angus, and the attendants. And Duncan, in his opening speech, suggests that how, be how beautifully pure the air is. He says, this castle has a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. And Banco kind of compliments Duncan's remark by suggesting this guest of summer, the temple haunting martlet, martlet is a kind of a bird, which only makes its nest in very pure places where the air is very fresh. So he says that the temple haunting, haunting martlet does approve by his loved mansion tree, which is his nest basically, that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. Now, here we have a colon. Now, you see in drama, uh, every pause, every punctuation mark plays a major role. And here we have this colon. It marks the pause as Banco stops to inhale the air. No jati frees buttress nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle where uh, procreant cradle, where the most breed and haunt, I have observed the air is delicate. So, once again, it suggests that the Macbeths, they are pure in their perversion. They are wholly evil. I know this sounds as an oxymoron, but that's the truth of the Macbeths. There's something outside and something, absolutely something else inside. Now, enter Lady Macbeth and Duncan says, see, see our honored hostess. The love that follows us sometimes is our trouble, which we still thank as love. Herein I teach you how you shall bid good God yield us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. So look, what happens is that Duncan is the king. So no matter in what uh, capacity he comes to your house, he still remains the king. Just take an instance, if tomorrow the Prime Minister were to come to your house, no matter in what capacity, he might be your uncle or your aunt or anybody, he might be uh, your closest friend or whatever, but imagine if the Prime Minister, because in the Indian uh, situation, the Prime Minister holds the highest position of uh, political relevance, in that sense, Imagine if the Prime Minister or the President comes to your house tomorrow. No matter how close that person is to you, you still have to observe certain protocols because he is holding a position. So no matter how much you love, so Rankan here suggests that no matter how much you love me, I am your husband's cousin, but here also I am the king. So there are certain observances which must be maintained. And therefore Duncan says that often the love that we bring with us also comes with some form of protocol and that protocol calls for some sort of uh, hard labor and although we thank that 
as love. So no matter how much we agree or disagree, we still call it love. Lady Macbeth says, all our service in every point twice done and then done double were poor and single business to contend against those honours deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house for those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them where rest your hermits. So, Lady Macbeth says, look, he echoes Macbeth's words in Act 1, uh, Scene 4, where Macbeth says that all our duties are to blah, 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 blah. So Lady Macbeth says that whatever we are doing is very poor work. By mentioning the word single business, she suggests that that is a very uh, basic work, that is a very poor work. So she says that whatever we are doing for you, if we did that double and then we redoubled it, that is, even if we do four times as what we are doing right now, even then that would be uh, very little compared to what you deserve from us. And therefore, she says that you have given us so much in the past, as well as recently, because you have given uh, Macbeth the position of the king of order. So, for that, we rest your hermits. Now, hermit here has a dual connotation. The first connotation suggests the word hermit, that is, we are your servants. But if you look at the Greek root of the Greek, of the word hermit, then you find that it comes from the Greek word eremia, E-R-E-M-I-A. Eremia means a desert dweller. Now let me take you back to Act 1, Scene 1, where one of the witches says, where the bliss? And the other says, upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. So what happens over here is that Lady Macbeth suggests that <coughs> She refers back to the words of the witches, the heath, desert dweller. And look, when she says, if we read this sentence in a deeper way, then we understand that all our service in every point twice done. What is the service that she will give to Duncan? Death. So twice done is kind of the hidden motive. So on the surface level, we are doing you service. But on the hidden level, we are doing ourselves some service by killing you. And then done double. So almost like I am reassuring for myself that I am going to kill you. So you see, there are certain hidden subtle nuances, which if you have read the play once and you go back to reread it, they come up popping in your mind. Now Duncan says, where's the thing of father? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, but he writes so well, and his great love, sharp as his power, hath pulled him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. So Duncan is now inquiring about where is Macbeth, because Macbeth ran, uh, Macbeth rode so fast before Duncan that they lost him. But look here, there is something very interesting, because Duncan calls Lady Macbeth, our fair hostess. And as we have seen from Act 1, Scene 1, fair is foul and foul is fair. Duncan fails to perceive that. Lady Macbeth says, your servants ever have theirs themselves and what is theirs in compt to make their audit at your highness's pleasure still to return your own. So we are your servants and whatever we have, whatever we are, and whatever belongs to us. So all of these belong to actually you. So we are uh, kind of welcoming you with your own givings, with your own uh, gifts. In Bengali, we say Gonga Jole Gonga Pujo. So we, uh, you kind of use the very water of the Ganges to offer to the Ganges in the same way. Now, Duncan says, give me your hand, conduct me to mine host, we love him highly, and shall continue our graces towards him by your leave, hostess. Now here Duncan uses the royal plural. The royalty, they do not use the singular number for the self, they use the plural. 
So when he says we, he means I. Now, uh, here I would like to pose one major question. If Lady Macbeth or the witches, they actually have pursued Macbeth to his action of murder, then Macbeth loses the uh, position, the grandeur of the position of the tragic hero. Now, try to understand this. Macbeth shall remain the tragic protagonist because protagonist, as the name suggests, protagonist comes from the uh, comes from two Greek words. One is proto, which means pro, and the other is agon. So action, agon means action. So whoever is uh, conducting the action, whoever is uh, taking the action forward, is the protagonist. That must be agreed. Macbeth is the tragic protagonist. But if you think that Lady Macbeth or the witches, they have persuaded Macbeth and Macbeth did not do it out of his own volition, then you are taking away from Macbeth the very uh, role of Macbeth as the uh, tragic hero. Because he, a hero has to be there in presence and in performance. Macbeth is there in presence. But if he has been performed upon rather than performing, then he is not the hero. So this is a question I would like you to keep in your mind and try to justify it in one way or the other when you are reading the text on your own time. I do not personally believe that the witches or Lady Macbeth actually kind of uh, influenced Macbeth in any way because he had this plan. So he would have done this either today or tomorrow. It was just a matter of time. Yes, I agree that they perhaps hastened the action of Duncan's murder, but Macbeth had already chalked out the entire plans that he would be murdering uh, Duncan. So now, without further ado, let's go into Act 1, Scene 7. Uh, oh, boys and torches. And uh, this is in one of the rooms in the castle. So Macbeth says, if it were done, when it is done, then it were well, it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his Circe's success, that, but this blow might be the be all and end all, here, but here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we will jump to the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here that we but teach bloody instructions which being taught return to plague the inventor. This even handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. This is one of the classic instances of Macbeth's soliloquies where Macbeth takes into consideration the pros and cons of his action. That is the action that he is going to commit. So he says, if it were done, when it is done, it were well, if it were done, quickly. Imagine you are doing some action, some action, any action. So if that action did not have any consequence. Whenever we are going into a cause, we always have an effect. Similarly, every action, according to the Newtonian law, every action has its own opposite and equal reaction. So every action entails a reaction. Every action entails a consequence. And Macbeth says that if when I murder Duncan, that is the end of it. That is the end of the story. If it were so, then it were best. Look, now he clarifies it. Because at the beginning, Macbeth cannot come to terms with the words. And still he cannot come to terms with the word murder. So he says assassination. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence, that is if it could wrap up the consequence. And if there were no further consequences of the murder, 
a catch with the Cersei's success. Cersei's means uh, seizing or ending. So if the murder could end in a seizing success, that, but this blow might be the be all and the end all. So look, he's talking about blow. So he has already planned to stab them. So he suggests that if it were so, that the blow would cover up its consequences, then it were the be all and the end all. That is, it would be the full stop. It would be the final pause here, but here. So now he considers that, but what happens in this real world upon this bank and shoal of time? Now, in some older editions, you had the words bench and school of time. Bank and shoal. Shoal means a shallow stretch of river. And some in some places you had the bench, uh, the words bench and school of time. So that version is still available in some very old editions. It doesn't matter. So since murder is also a form of uh, a kind of a study. So that's why he is using that. But he says, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump to life to come. So when the thing has ended, then we can go to the next thing. So whatever life has to offer next. But in these cases, we still have judgment here. Macbeth knows that if he murders Duncan in his own home, then he has to face some form of judgment because he has murdered the king and that cannot go unnoticed that we but teach bloody instructions which being taught written to plague the inventor. So Macbeth pauses for a moment and he considers that if I murder Duncan today, what is the guarantee that somebody will not plan to murder me tomorrow and use up the throne for me? So look, Macbeth being a very shrewd military person, he is taking into consideration everything. So he is not that stupid person who would do anything that some vague witches tell him. He would not do anything because his wife wants to become the queen. He would not do anything on a whim. That is basically my point. <clears throat> he is weighing both the sides of the scale. And he says that whenever we teach such bloody instructions, because if I murder Duncan, then there would be a chance that the blame would fall upon me. So, in a way, I will be creating a series of murderers who might murder me tomorrow. So, he says, this even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. Now, here, I uh, am not sure. Okay, but uh, you see, since the last day of 1599, that is 31st December, Queen Elizabeth I, she issued a royal charter which gave the British East India Company the full right to do a tax-free trade in India in 1599, 31st December. This marked the beginning of the East India Company's travels and its annals in India. Now, during this time, King Akbar had passed away. And as we have all heard the stories that King Akbar was poisoned to death. He wanted to poison Man Singh, but somehow the cups got mixed and he died of poison himself. So, this is a story which was very popular in India back in that time. And whenever the merchants would return to England, I personally believe that they perhaps carried with them these stories. And perhaps Shakespeare heard it from somewhere. And maybe there is a reference to that small event over here. Now, I am not sure of it. I haven't read it anywhere. But 
the time frames overlap and therefore i think that there might be a very faint chance i'm not sure though. okay so take it with a pinch of salt but the time frames overlap so that's why i think it is. Uh, because otherwise these lines are uh, not that significant i mean he is already saying shakespeare has already made it clear that uh, justice kind of comes to like the perpetrator then why would he repeat this chalice metaphor because this chalice met because Duncan is not poisoned he's murdered isn't that so and uh, moreover what happens over here is that uh, his two guards were poisoned and not Duncan himself so I do not find any relevance of this metaphor otherwise that's why I think that this was a very popular story and Shakespeare, since he was putting so many topical things in his play, there might be a chance. I'm not sure. You can accept it, you can deny it. Either way, I do not know. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the dead. Then, as his host who should against his murderer, Look, once again, he cannot utter the word murder or a hard D sound does not come from, from his mouth. Against his mother, shut the door, not bear the night myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his facilities so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet tongued against the deed, against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity like a newborn, like a naked newborn babe, striding the blast, or heaven's cherubims horsed upon the cyclist curious of air, shall blow the horrid did in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. Now look, Macbeth says that Duncan is here in double trust. Actually, he's suggesting triple trust. First of all, Duncan is his cousin, so there is the personal relationship. Secondly, Macbeth is the subject of Duncan. So there is the political relationship. Thirdly, since Macbeth is the host, so there is a guest is like a god. So there is a providential relationship that they share. With. Or you can call it the social, political and personal relationships that Macbeth shares with Duncan. So he says that I should stop anybody from murdering him and not bear the knife myself now look if macbeth had not planned it already then why does he portray them why does he picture the knife in his mind why does he talk about the knife in the first place and then he says that duncan is such a good human being he's such a good king that if i go to murder him then pity and damnation they would Basically, he understands that his deeds will bring him eternal damnation. And the enormity of his crime kind of luridly brings out the images of death before him. And then he says, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which overleaps itself and falls on the other side. So look, Macbeth suggests that why do I wish to kill him? He has not done me any wrong. He has given me a worthy position. Now tomorrow, when he actually, if he were to, if he were allowed to live, when he would grow really old and he would actually abduct his throne, abdicate his throne, then Duncan might choose Macbeth, or Malcolm might find it without outside his power to actually rule England, uh, I mean, sorry, Scotland. And therefore, Macbeth might eventually become the king because the witches never suggested how Macbeth will become the king. They merely said, all hail Macbeth, that shall be king hereafter. So the witches never suggested to Macbeth that you kill Duncan and you become the king. That was Macbeth's own mental image. So Macbeth had planned the murder, not the witches. And Macbeth had told Lady Macbeth that this is uh, this and this and this and this and this is going to happen. Otherwise, how does she get in so synced to Macbeth's plan? 
that she kind of utters everything in toto of what Macbeth is going to do. Now, these are questions which we all must need to pause and ponder. Because, you know, you cannot just go and say that, okay, the witches did it, the uh, uh, lady did it, and so on and so forth. So Macbeth says that I do not have any issues against Duncan. All I have is an ambition. An ambition which overlips itself. Now, Harry Levin has a very brilliant book on, not on Shakespeare though, but on Christopher Marlowe called The Overreacher. Now, the Renaissance, according to Harry Levin, uh, offered certain characters who are called overreachers. Okay. Uh, every Renaissance hero is, a, is an overreacher, a tragic overreacher. What is an overreacher? Now, primarily an overreacher in its uh, very literal sense. Uh, an overreacher refers to a person, it's like a horse rider. So when you have to ride on a horse, you have to take a leap. You have to jump a bit on the horse's back. That's the custom. Now, if you jump too low, then you would not reach the horse's back and you will fall down. But if you jump too high, then you will jump on the top of the horse and on the other side. You will fall on the other side. So that is what an overreacher does. And Macbeth says that I'll be doing the same thing. Now imagine that very own Macbeth who has actually been a very good horseman. He has taken a horse in battle. He has uh, been compared to Ares, Bellona's bride. And back in those days, horses were the only fast carriers that we had, the only fast vehicles that we had. So Macbeth is using this metaphor. And you see this riding metaphor can be found in multiple of Renaissance literature. Even uh, if you look at Sir Philip Sidney's An Apology for Poetry, it begins with the metaphor of horse riding. <coughs> so you have multiple references to this uh, horse riding. So here, look, there is a dash. There is Macbeth wants to say something more, but suddenly Lady Macbeth enters. And look at the line placements. They are so beautifully placed where Macbeth's line ends. Right at a straight line, Lady Macbeth's words begin. So this is a kind of uh, small stage direction. How now? What news? So Macbeth breaks his uh, monologue and he addresses Lady Macbeth. How now? What's new? Or what news? And Lady Macbeth says, he has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? So they are having a banquet in Duncan's honor. And Lady Macbeth says that his supper is almost done. But why have you left the banquet all? And Macbeth says, have you asked for me? No, you not. He has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late. And I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. So Macbeth once again uses a clothing imagery. Now look, number one is here there are a few discrepancies. Let me point them out and then tell you what I think and you can tell me in the comment section what you think. Point number one is that Macbeth does not give Lady Macbeth the exact reasons he does not tell Lady Macbeth that, okay, this is what I am thinking. He says that he has given me honours and I want to wear those honours and not cast them aside so soon. So this is not what Macbeth was thinking. Alright, so he does not give Lady Macbeth the specific reasons. This is point number one. Point number two is that Lady Macbeth is being incited by Macbeth. This is what I personally believe. Imagine two, three friends have decided to go on a trip and suddenly uh, all of the friends have gathered and suddenly one of your friends who is the main entertainer or who is the main guy or the girl of the group whom you have a lot of trust on, when you call him or her up and she says, uh, sorry, I can't go, I'm a bit tired, so what would you do? Would you cancel the plan or would you ask that person that you get up? And you come here as quickly as possible. I guess the second thing happens. So what Macbeth is doing here is that he is playing a game of reverse psychology. 
he knows that if he backs out at the final moment then lady macbeth would urge him that you go on and you do it because he knows lady macbeth and he knows that she won't be able to do it so he deliberately kind of does it according to me number 3 is that there is another opinion that he is contemplating further and when macbeth is contemplating that how should i go become the king or how should i arrive at kingship then i believe that macbeth is having uh, more and more reasons more and more variables to consider rather than this very straightforward way of looking at murdering them so these three possible reasons are there either macbeth does not believe lady macbeth properly or does not think that she is worthy of being disclosing uh, worthy of being uh, uh, worthy of being disclosed to the facts secondly macbeth is inciting her to do the work or persuade him to do the work thirdly macbeth is now considering reconsidering as more and more variables are popping up and look lady macbeth takes the second she says was the hope drunk wedding you dressed yourself had it set since and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely from this time such a account they love from this time such a account they love art thou afeard to be the same in thy own act and valor as thou art in desire wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life and live a coward in thy own esteem let it i dare not and i would like the poor cat in the adage so lady macbeth says that are you a coward do you love me only this much that uh, you can't even do it for me are you such a coward that you can desire something and then say no no i am afraid rather than saying yes i will do it because i have desired it. so are you a man who is different in desire and in action lady macbeth thinks that between macbeth's action and his desire falls the shadow but she uh, does not realize or does not want to realize that macbeth is the one who will have to take the social brunt of it because people would not write away doubt lady macbeth unless she gives her silver that people will be doubting macbeth definitely and macbeth says pretty peace this comes up i dare do all that and may become a man who dares do more is now so there is nobody else who is as valiant as me so don't give me that lecture and then lady macbeth continues what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me look she says this you told me everything you told me the plan enterprise so you told me the plan that is what i have been saying all this time so it's a misreading according to me if you think that lady macbeth was the one who is the fourth witch or the witches are the one who actually incited macbeth macbeth had thought this all along when you does do it then you were a man and to be more than what you were you would be so much more than a man not time nor place did then adhere and yet you would make both they they have made themselves and that their fitness now does unmake you so back when you made all of these plans then the time was not right the place was not right and still you thought of different ways to achieve your goal by murdering duncan and now that both the time is right and the place is right duncan has offered himself up to us this is the golden opportunity and now you are backing down <coughs> and look here comes a very problematic section of lady macbeth's speeches she says i have given some and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me i would while it was smiling in my face had plucked my nipple from his bloodless gums and dashed the brains out had i so sworn as you have done to this but you know no matter how fiendish she pretends to be 
her womanliness betrays her. And therefore, I believe that the words here are very strained and very artificial. Whenever she talks about something dangerous, she again talks in a motherly term or in a household term, in a womanly term. And by the word womanly, I refer to a woman of that time, not a woman of this time. So she refers to things which are known to her. And she talks about motherhood and she creates a perversion out of motherhood. But no matter what she tries to do, I believe that she's so very enmeshed in that world of motherhood that uh, herein lies the problem. Also, there is another problem that is, as we understand that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth did not have any children in this play at least. So, how can Lady Macbeth have given some? This is one of the problems that has remained till today. And L.C. Knights wrote an essay, how many children did Lady Macbeth have? There is a brilliant book by A.C. Bradley called Shakespearean Tragedy. If you want, you can look it up. The essay is available there and there are a few good essays on Shakespeare's tragedies overall. So you can look them up and you can try to make some sense out of them. That's all up to you. And look, Macbeth says, if we should fail, then Macbeth says, we fail. Now here I would uh, bring it to your attention that in different editions, you find different punctuation marks. Here, if you are following Kenneth Muir as I am, you have a question mark. In certain editions, there is an exclamation mark. In certain editions, there is a full stop. <coughs> now, why am I referring to this? Look, if we say we fail and then we put a question mark, then Lady Macbeth is in disbelief that we cannot fail. If we put an exclamation mark, then Lady Macbeth is believing we fail. How dare you say we fail? So she is charging her husband. And if you put the full stop, then we fail. Simple. If we fail, we fail. So it's like a gamble. So look, we have three different opinions right here with just one punctuation mark. So that's how important the punctuation is. But screw your courage to the sticking place and we will not fail. So you make your courage permanent and we will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rod, the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him. So Duncan is tired and he will fall asleep. So when he falls asleep, his two chamber limbs will I with wine and wassail so convince. So when he falls asleep, his two guards, I'll put them to sleep with wine and porridge. That memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. When in swinish sleep, their drenched natures lie as in death. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers, and who shall bear the guilt of our great wealth? Now, according to Elizabethan physiology, the brain had three levels. Okay. On the topmost level was imagination. On the medium level was reason. And on the bottom rank was memory. Okay. So therefore, he says, uh, therefore, she says that memory, which is the warder of the brain. So, which is basically the guard of the brain. So, she basically suggests over here that when they are drunk so much, look, he calls the officers of Duncan is spongy. So they will be drunk so much just like a sponge soaks water. They will be soaking in wine. So I'll make them so drunk that they will forget what they have done. And then we can do whatever we want on the unguarded Duncan. And we can put the blame of all those actions on those guards. But once again, she cannot utter the word kill. She uses a doublet of the word quell our great quill. 
Macbeth says, bring forth men, children only. Here, look, just uh, in Act 1, Scene 5, Lady Macbeth has suggested that unsex me here. And here she is kind of chastising Macbeth with her own words as she has suggested in Act 1, Scene 5. And she has chastised Macbeth into becoming the murderous child. She has undone Macbeth as her husband. And now Macbeth, the murderous child, is born almost. So Macbeth says, bring forth men, children only. For thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Because according to that time's uh, belief, males were more capable than females. You know the patriarchal old belief. Will it not be received when we have marked the blood, marked with blood, those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers that they have done it? So now he says that if we murder Duncan with the very daggers of his chamberlains and we spill the blood on them, then it would seem like they have murdered Duncan. Who dares receive it otherwise? So who dares receive it otherwise? as we shall make our griefs and clamor roll upon his death. So we will pretend that we are so very grip sticker that nobody else would be able to point at us. I am settled that bent up each corporeal agent to his terrible to this terrible feat. Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth. So pretension must hide all our dark actions so with this we end act one now uh, in this uh, video session i think i would do act two scene one uh, then we can go to the other things so act two scene one is prop is popularly known as the dagger scene so scene one, the same court within the castle, so it's in Burness. Enter Banco and Fleance. Fleance is Banco's son, with a torch before him. How goes the night, boy? So how is the night? Because they are on guard duty. The moon is down. I have not heard the clock. And she goes down at 12. So the moon goes down at 12. So it's past midnight. I take these latest, sir. Here, take my sword. So Banco says that he is having his sword in his hand and Banco says that you hold my sword for some time and then look there is a full stop and a dash so Banco is looking up to search for the moon and he says there is husbandry in heaven. Now this thing has two meanings. One that no stars or the moon is visible in heaven and two God is not watching over earth tonight because Duncan would be murdered. And then he looks at Cleans and then he says, take me that too. That means the torch. <coughs> a heavy summons lies like lead upon me, and yet I would not sleep. So he's very sleepy and still he would not sleep because the video kind of disturbed him. And he says, Mon, restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. So Banco is equally disturbed by what the witches have said. But he chooses not to pawn upon them. Banco chooses to ignore them at any cost and Macbeth chooses to think of them at any cost. And then he asks Cleon that you give me my sword back. Enter Macbeth and a servant with a torch. And Banco asks who's there? Macbeth says a friend. Already Macbeth is planning and plotting. False face must hide what the false heart of him, as he has already said. Now Banco is no longer a friend Macbeth. If, if Banco does not help Macbeth in killing Duncan or in pursuing his plans. Banco, what sir? Not yet at rest. The king said it. He had been in unusual pleasure and sent for the great largest to your office. So the king has sent a lot of gifts to your office. 
this diamond he greets like all with all means with simple so by the name of most kind hostess and shut up in measureless content so duncan has brought a huge diamond for lady macbeth and then he gave it for lady macbeth as the kindest hostess and then he went to sleep and macbeth says being unprepared our will became the servant to defect which else should free have wrought so we were not prepared for duncan and therefore though we will to serve him let's work to serve and to murder but we were unprepared so there have been defects all spell i dreamt last night of the three weird sisters to you too so look now banco has started to put his doubts on because to macbeth they have shown some truth the banco considers that if macbeth shall become king then what is going to happen to him and look macbeth falsely claims i think not of them yet when we can entreat an art to serve we would spend it in some words upon that business if you would grant that time so when you have some leisure later why don't we sit down and talk upon it because i don't think of them i don't think much of them but look this is a falsity to both you and i at your kindest leisure if you shall cleave to my consent when it is it shall make honor for you so look macbeth is already giving a hint that look whatever is going to happen if you stick by my side then i'll ensure that you get some honor and banco already knows macbeth so banco chooses righteousness and he says so i lose none in seeking to augment it but still keep my bosom franchise and allegiance clear i shall be counsel so as long as i am truthful to the throne of scotland and my allegiance remains clear my conscience remains clear i shall listen to you i shall always be by your side as long as my conscience and my allegiance remain clear so the banco is very clear cut in his notions and macbeth quickly ends the discussion good repose the while thanks sir the like so good night so exeunt banco and clients exeunt is the plural form of the word exit macbeth to a servant uh, go bid thy mistress when my drink is ready she strike upon the bell get thee to bed so now macbeth asks the servant that when my drink is ready ask your mistress to ring a bell but this bell is actually a signal that duncan's guards have been put to sleep and now it's time to go and murder him now you realize that if you uh, it's a very common thing that happens to all of us imagine your exams are coming close and you are thinking about your exams all day and all night sometimes it so happens that in your dream you think of your exams you have dreams of exams similarly macbeth has repressed the thoughts of murder so much in his mind he is so very engrossed in the thoughts of murder that the thoughts of murder come to him they kind of project themselves as a hallucination to macbeth and macbeth has planned to murder duncan with a dagger the night and now he can as if see the knife that's as if his intent is physically manifesting itself so that uh, it becomes a, almost like a reality to him a hallucination but nonetheless a reality is this a dagger which i see before me so macbeth is seeing a dagger before himself the handle toward my hand so imagine this pen is a dagger and the cap side is the handle so macbeth is seeing a dagger like this so is this a dagger before me the handle toward my hand and now macbeth is trying to imagine this dagger is floating and macbeth is trying to catch the hilt and the dagger is vanishing so come let me clutch the and the dagger vanishes i have 
the not and yet i see this still art thou not fatal vision fatal vision means ominous deadly and symbolic of the uh, murder art thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to sight so are you a hallucination or are you real or art thou but a dagger of the mind a false creation proceeding from the heat of pressed brain so look shakespeare forecasts psychological studies he forecasts psychoanalysis that is something when something is so very repressed in your mind it kind of manifests itself in the real world i see the yet in form as palpable as this one which i draw now he draws his own dagger which he has with him with which he would murder thou marshalest me the way i was going so you kind of take me to the way to duncan's bedroom and such an instrument i was to use i was going to use a similar instrument my eyes are made the fools of the other senses or else worth all the rest so either my eyes are becoming fools to all my other senses so either my sight is being fooled by all other senses or i am seeing a real dagger and i do not know which one it is then he says i see this still and now an actor might rub his eyes and try to look at it i see this still and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood which was not so before now suddenly the dagger has changed its changed its, its nature and there are gouts of blood on it there's no such thing it is the bloody business which informs thus to my eyes so then he realizes that there is no such dagger but only that his mind is playing games with him now over the one half world the nature seems dead and wicked dreams abuse the curtain of sleep so now he says on the other on this half of the world the people are asleep nature is asleep and wicked dreams abuse the curtain of sleep so people might might have nightmares which car which craft celebrates pale hecate's offerings so it's a key word showing macbeth's devotion or his affinity to the religious atmosphere of the world of antithesis pale hecate's offering hecate is the kind of celebrated goddess of the witches and withered mother once again he uses uh, mother but this is perhaps the first time that we see him coming so close to out of the world mother alarmed by his sentinel the wolf whose howls his watch thus with stealthy pace so he now refers to the wolf as the sentinel of murder so what happens is that whenever somebody is given a death sentence so there is a sentinel a guard who kind of warns him at every hour that so many hours are left till you are hang so similarly as if the wolf is nature's sentinel and he says thus with his stealthy pace with tarquin's ravishing strides tarquin tried to physically rape and steal the chastity of lucretia for pleasure macbeth on the other hand will attempt at an emotional uh defilement of scotland's beliefs scotland's faith by trying to murder them he would steal his um he would steal the throne and he would betray his trust by murdering them so thus with his stealthy pace with tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design moves like a ghost so as i move towards duncan and my shadow follows me it feels like i am tarquin and i am almost going with going on with my ravishing strides towards a uh, kind of defiling duncan in the same way as lucretia was once defiled by tarquin and then he says as his footsteps are making sounds he says <coughs> excuse me Uh, thou sure and firm set earth hear not my steps which way they walk for fear thy very stones fret of my whereabout 
and take the present horror from the time which now swoops with it. So he as if implores the earth that do not hear my footsteps because your stones will be afraid. And what if they tell somebody of my whereabouts? The present fear is good because it keeps me under check. Because the time is such, my actions are such that the present fear suits it. While I threat, he lives. Words to the heat of dates to hold breath gives. So look, half of his mind, half of his heart is still not in the game. He is still dwindling between resolution and firmness. And uh, between resolution and action, he is still in a limbo. As in Act 1, Scene 3, the witches said, he shall dwindle, peak and pine. And Macbeth is still dwindling and peaking and pining. So he says that while I kind of consider all things and uh, while I move towards his room, he still lives. And all I can do is uh, I can uh, go on talking and talking and talking and I can go on considering and reconsidering. But my deed, which is the murder itself, is becoming cold like a cold porridge. And then there is a signal, the bell rings. I go and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a nail that summons thee to heaven, not to hell. So he says, now I am going to do the work. I am going and the work shall be done. The bell invites me. And then he says, do not hear it, Duncan. For it is a summons that will call you to heaven, not to hell, but to me. This is surely a summons to heaven. Here we stop today. And in the next lecture, we'll continue from Act 2, Scene 2, which is the murder scene. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, put it in the comment section. See you once again. Thank you.